Hi. So I'm recording this because uh, Clive Philpot asked, so it's 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 being recorded. So I just want to welcome. Well, let's wait two minutes, okay? And um, Richard, come back. <laughs> he's he's in the corner of his room. He's like he's like there's a fly here. If, when I'm going <laughs> like that, it's like a fly. So somebody else, uh, Amy White. Um, Richard, it's so nice to see your face. Oh, I, I don't think we can quite hear you. Richard, you need to unmute. Okay. <laughs> can you hear us? Richard, can you hear us? Okay. So is your microphone connected to your computer? No. You oh. need to go into your preferences and and open up your microphone, I think. So uh, so I'm letting in a couple more lurkers. So uh, Richard, you can you can work on it. I think you'll have it figured out by the time we start talking. I'm I think I'm gonna wait one more minute till uh, more people are coming in. This is nice. Uh, we've been talking about this a long time, doing this, huh, Julie? And we have, I and I think we always imagined we would do it in person in your bookstore. <laughs> yeah, but I think, you know, I think Ray would like this more because he he he, he doesn't have to be here. <laughs> and, and Definitely. That would, be the main, that would be the main thing he would like. And- uh, Well, and I- I think like this really looks like I'm just going to take a picture of it because I don't I don't know how to do screenshots. But like really, here we've got the ultimate <laughs> seating chart. We'll do a bunny. bunny uh, <laughs> so Anna Grant, the ultimate seating chart. Yeah, I mean, look at this. Like this grid is totally like a seating chart that Ray would um, yeah. have drawn. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, okay. I'm just gonna. I'm intro, I'll introduce you. And see, there's all these. So I'm gonna sort of stand back from this a little bit. And uh, I guess I, maybe what we should do is have um, you talk for a while, and then maybe pass it to John uh, Held, and then kind of uh, uh, go on. Maybe by that time, Richard will be be it, you know live. And I'll just kind of admit people as they come in. And uh, so anyways, Julie, I've, I've known for, for, I don't know how long, but sometime before this book came out, you came to the store and we talked and uh, talked about maybe Ray. Ray used to come here in the eighties. He was like a kind of a, a, a figure that came into the bookstore and started to look at every book. He would pull it out from the shelf and he'd stare at it and then he'd put it back. And he'd do that all day long for about eight hours. And then he would leave. And I kind of knew after about three hours, it was Ray, Jeff, it was Ray who he was. Uh, Cause I go, this is kind of weird. This is like a performance going on. And so uh, we talked a little bit and then he, uh, he brought in one time I, I remember I went to his car and he had all these drawings, piles of drawings. He brought them into the store. He, he said, you wanna look at my drawings? So uh, he started placing them on the shelves and every, you know, in the store. And that was like another little performance. Every time I saw him, it was like a thing. And then I think he used to come here to visit his mother uh, who was not in good health. And so, um, trying to think of some other Ray stories. So one night we were having a midnight uh, madness party and Ray wanted, I don't know, I think he just had this idea of doing a performance. And I said, okay, at midnight, we'll do a performance. You know, we'll, we'll just do it. So we kind of advertised it on the front of our store. Uh, and it said like performance tonight, Ray Johnson, uh, blah, blah, blah. And so uh, what he actually did, I was probably the only one that noticed it, is he had these, uh, he bought these letters at a, at a hardware store, you know, like with 
and they spelled out my name and he put them on the uh, on the advertisement for his performance <laughs> backwards so that it was so it was just a thing you know and he, and uh, and then he signed books we didn't have many of his many books about him except the we had a stack of the pop art book by um, what was the one uh, made in America maybe uh, it was like a collection and he was in it uh, and we had it like on a remainder shelf. So they were like $3.99 each, you know, that, and we had a big stack. And I think, uh, who's that famous dealer from New York was in it. And he talked about Ray, about the Plymouth Rock, you know, Ray's uh, pop art being like the, um, the, you know, the famous Warhol guy, Gear, Ge Ge uh, what was his name? Um, I'm so Henry close. Henry Geerdholzer or something. Well, Henry Geldholzer was the curator at the Met. That was the guy. Yeah, he was okay. kind of a dealer, you know, of 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 stuff in a way, and and so he he was the one that called the you know the Elvis and the the early pop images like the Plymouth Rocks of, of pop art, and so this this was in that, that book. So people bought the book at, uh, at the at the at that Midnight Madness sale. And Ray stood there and signed them for everybody backward, you know, with this backwards handwriting thing. And it was kind of a fun, fun, like uh, a little event. Um, so anyways, I wanna thank uh, Julie for finally doing this and I'm gonna give, give it to you now and uh, let you talk. This is a great book, it's only 20 bucks. It's, it's very, it's very, it's worth every penny. Um, we have it here. Get, you could get it anywhere, but get it from an independent store in your in your neighborhood or or bookshop.org is good too. Wonderful. Thank you, Carrie, so much sure. for having us. And um, yeah, anyone, if you're ever in Michigan, um, go to the Detroit Institute of Arts to see Ray's uh, sanded collage there, and then go to Bookbeat in Oak Park. Um, and you'll just discover um, art treasures. I mean, I saw one of the big Fluxus, the Fluxus Codex. I remember on the shelves at your bookstore and I dreamed of owning it, but <laughs> it was definitely, you know, um, out of my book price range. But, you know, Carrie has such an amazing bookstore. Um, and yeah, we've been talking about trying to do a bookstore event because if you grow up in Michigan, um, often your parents are still there. Same, same for me. I grew up closer to Lansing, Ray in Detroit. Um, and it's like, you know, what you do when you go home, you know, you see people you know, um, but you seek out these, these places and these refuges. And, and BookBeat is one of those. And one day, Carrie let me interview him on the prompt, um, just like, and I just, I don't even know. It was like probably half an hour that I'm just asking Carrie about Ray. And I just walked into the bookstore unannounced. Um, but he was uh, such a, a good soul and he shared some of those stories with you tonight. So, you know, as much as we know about Ray, there's so much that has not been recorded or to here we have a new, a new recording and a recounting and something for the archive. So Gary, thank you for sharing those stories. Sure. Um, yes, and thank you to Julia um, Klein from Sibbers Cove Press for publishing this book. Um, they're a small press based out of Chicago. She's and I just, again, no. <laughs> I loved um, these interviews, the interviews Ray did, they seem performative, um, they seem special, they, some of them were hard to find, um, some of them once were on the internet and then disappeared, um, so we're really lucky tonight, um, I've gotten to invite some of the other interviewers weren't able to join us tonight, but we have three of them with us, um, we've got John Held Jr. Um, joining us from California. Um, sorry, I'm still working on, um, cause I've called you Westleya in my mind. So um, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's Westleya, but you can call me anything you want. Westleya who um, <laughs> interviewed Ray um, on uh, the Long Island radio station um, years ago. Um, I believe yours is 19. So John's interviewed Ray in 1977, almost 44 years ago. 
Um, Westlea interviewed Ray in 1984, 27 years ago. Um, Richard Piper, who's still getting his audio. Richard, can you hear us yet? Can we hear you? All right, we'll keep checking in with Richard throughout the night, but hopefully um, we'll be able to hear him. But if not, we can see him, which is really great. Um, but Richard interviewed Ray by phone, because uh, that was the technology in the 1980s um, and recorded it, which again is also even almost hard to do before the pandemic. Um, but in 1980, so 41 years ago. So decades later, here we are on this new technology that looks like a seating chart and we're all in a grid, um, which I think is just um, pretty unbelievable. Um, but we're not in person, but at least we can share our voices. So um, I have things that I can share um, from the book. I think I've said a little bit, but I would love to just, you know, we have this rare chance to talk <laughs> about these interviews with people who actually conducted them. Um, so John, would you like to go first? Would you, because I know you had something that you were thinking of sharing with us too, but. Uh, yeah, I was going to talk about going to his house. Yes. Um, but I'll, I'll get to the interview first, if that's okay. That'd be great. Okay. Um, well, I was a reference librarian in upstate New York, which is a completely obsolete you know, position these days. There is no such thing as a, refer a reference librarian. There's Google. So anyway, uh, I went to Europe for the first time, 1977. And when I was in Amsterdam, I saw a rubber stamp store with a wooden hand with a stamp under it, with it uh, kind of like an old medieval sign. And uh, it was called uh, Stample Platz. And uh, or it was called Posthumous Rubber Stamp Company. And it was a very interesting rubber stamp company because they had a royal charter. And they got the royal charter because they were making, the Nazis used them to make up stamps during World War II, but they would make up extra stamps and give them to the resistance. So uh, after the war, the queen gave them this royal charter. Very interesting company. They had a selection of visual rubber stamps and that, and that was kind of the first time that I clicked on rubber stamps that I might be able to use them. Well, actually I was thinking of bringing them home as gifts for my kids, which I did, but then I kept them for myself. And I decided to see if there were any other artists using rubber stamps. And so being a reference librarian, you know, I went about my job and, you know, tried to find information and it was very difficult at the time. Um, but one day in the New York Times, uh, the, they interviewed um, Ken Spicer in Providence, Rhode Island, who ran uh, Bizarro Rubber Stamps. And he talked about artists, you know, using their stamps and everything. So I wrote to him and I said, can you give me some heads up on other artists using rubber stamps? And he says, this is whole male art movement and they use rubber stamps. And here's the name of two people in the movement, Ray Johnson and E.M. Plunkett. So I write this very formal letter to them. I use rubber stamps. Do you use rubber stamps? I would love to see examples of your rubber stamps. I mean, I'm only like 27 at the time. So I'm like a complete idiot, of course. <clears throat> so I wrote to them, they wrote right back. I started this, intensive uh, correspondence with Ray. <clears throat> uh, I mean, he seemed very open to what I was asking. And um, yeah, I mean, we just seemed to get along. I should mention one thing. The reason we got along so well is at the time I was a reference librarian, but I also had a second job being an archivist at Oneida Community, this religious utopian community from the 19th century. So I was very much into intentional community and Ray was too, and that bonded us. <clears throat> and I picked up right away that this male art community, <laughs> totally what I was after, you know, it was this international community of artists. Yeah, I was kind of into utopian thought at the time and everything before I discovered that I didn't like people very much. Anyway, Mail art is perfect, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
So, you know, I continued this correspondence with Ray. Eventually, he had an exhibition and performance at Hamilton College, which is in Clinton, New York, which is 10 miles from Utica. So I went to his performance, which he called a floor rolling event for Barry White. And he put candles out and then rolled over the, the lit candles. That's basically it. Uh, I asked him, um, you know, after the performance, if he would come to the Mid York Library System where I was working <clears throat> as a video library. So I was all set up with video and everything. You know, I didn't have to make arrangements, this and that. It was very easy. And he was spending an extra day in Utica at the Holiday Inn Motel. So he agreed to come over to the library system. And when we sat down and strapped in, put on the mics and everything, uh, uh, he said, this will just be five minutes. And I said, fine, you know. Uh, and then as soon as we started, you know, he stopped the interview and said, you know, can you hear me, this and that? And I said, yes, you know, we checked. And, uh, and then we rolled for like, I don't know, an hour, 40, 40 minutes or so. And he was very open to, you know, just about everything. Um, the one thing that I, I'd like to stress is how smart Ray was um, and how steeped in art history he was. Uh, I mean, he was, he really knew his stuff. And, you know, I thought I was a big shot, you know, knew everything about Dada art and everything like this. And he whips out the name the Baroness Elsa von Laufenheimer, you know, you know, who was one of Deschamps' friends, you know, in, in New York in 1917 or whatever. So, I mean, he really dug into the history. He knew his stuff. And of course he was taught by Josef Albers, you know, so pff, you don't get much better than that, quite frankly. <clears throat> so um, that led that interview. I mean, we kept corresponding and everything, you know, after the interview. You could read the interview for yourself, plus it's on YouTube, um, or part of it is anyway. Uh, but my parents lived in Long Island, in Wanto, Long Island, in the South Shore. Ray lived on the North Shore of Long Island. And I was coming home, you know, to visit them, uh, my parents, and uh, I asked them if I could visit. He said, sure, you know. And he sent a letter, call me when you're this way and gave me his phone number. So, you know, I called up and I was at my parents' house and went to visit him. And boy, that was rare. I mean, William Wilson never visited him. He didn't let anybody in that house. The only other person I know that was in his house, in Locust Valley, this is. The pink was house, which was actually a gray house, right? You know, he called I, I would, it the pink house right. at a, for a period, but then my 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 memory is that it was actually painted gray. But from what someone said, you know what I can't even remember to tell you the truth. <laughs> <clears throat> the only thing I remember, the the sharpest picture I remember, you walk in the house, open the front door, and right there, there's the stairs that go up, goes up to the second floor, and at the top of the stairs, there's a closet over to the right and the closet was open. And in the bottom of the closet were the saddle shoes with John on one of them, painted on one of them and Cage on the other. And I just thought that was so cool. But the coolest thing of all, this was in 1977, I saw them 20 years later in a vitrine at the Whitney Museum of Art. There you go. Uh huh. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> that was them. Only they were men's. <clears throat> oh, there, there, these are men's. And oh, okay. the best part is um, in Nick Maravell's um, recordings of Tate of Ray. Um, uh -huh. Ray says like a J.C. Penny shoe, um, mm. a shoe from J.C. Penny's. And so I bought these online, but the Black Mountain College Conference, which is where we met right. um, a number of years ago, um, John, is coming up. And so the theme is John Cage. So I'm going to remake Ray Shoes for John Cage. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I know it's a great piece. It's just, it was just so beautiful too. 
and you know it, it, his lettering was so exquisite i mean you know so it just makes it special that way and the other impressions i got from uh, the visit to the house was you know he had a habit of when he had visitors he would clear everything out you know this this was happening when he was in new york but you know, I, I don't know if he did the same thing for me or he just didn't have anything in the house, but the whole bottom, you know, living room area, there was nothing in it except some boxes, you know, lined up around the edges of the room. Uh, during the course of our visit, I was there for a couple of hours and uh, we took a walk and uh, uh, th there was a beach, you know, maybe five minutes from his house, you know, that he could walk to. And he called it Brancusi Beach. He said Brancusi was at this beach when he visited New York and, you know, whatever the date was and everything. So we went to Brancusi Beach. And then we went to uh, Joanna Vanderbeek, hmm. Vanderbeek's house. Uh, Stan Vanderbeek was an experimental, you know, filmmaker, Joanna. Who, was, who went to Black Mountain College too. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I don't know, did Joanna go there as well? I, I, I don't know, but um, yeah, so I mean, so we stopped by there. So we, we had like a little day together and everything, you know, it was, uh, but I mean, he was very gracious, very nice, you know, always at my level, never, you know, pretentious whatsoever, you know, very down to earth, very mysterious. Um, one thing I want to say I about, I one just thing wanted I want to say one thing about Elle's uh, interview, about your interview in this, that uh -huh. it is one of the most straightforward interviews in the book. You know, it's like you, you got him to respond to your questions because you're talking about the work and not right. about his life and where he was born and, you know, like a lot of history that he didn't care about. Right. I thought that your, your interview really kind of got to into it a little bit. I mean, you can tell he's kind of joking around a, a little uh, there, but. Um. Yeah, well, I've interviewed a number of people over the years. Alan Caprow, Clement Greenberg, John Cage, Anna Halperin, et cetera, et cetera. The thing about, and Ray and John Cage were extremely similar in a way because they had these pregnant pauses. And when you're interviewing, you do not want to step on your subject's lines. So sometimes you just have to sit back, you know, and write it out. Well, he was very performative. He was a per performative person, I think. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I, I don't think he was quite in reality like a lot of people are. That it was yeah. kind of, uh, he was kind of very self-conscious about what he was saying. Exactly. Was mm -hmm. And what the responses were going to be. He was right. kind of three or four steps ahead of, you know, exactly. about this. Yeah. Yeah. It was a chess match for sure, you know. But I was too stupid to realize it. So I just plowed right ahead, you know. Uh, but it was great. I mean, you know, so we, you know, communicated, you know, well after that time and everything. And uh, he eventually, uh, uh, dropped me from the New York Correspondence School. He never really gave me a, a reason why. Um, I, I'm not even sure why, to tell you the truth, but uh, he, he took me back into the fold, you know, sometime later, you know. And uh, we corresponded, uh, I'll, I'm finishing in a second, and uh, we corresponded, I mean, right to the end of his life. Um, I think the last letter I got from him was in December, 1994. And it was an enclosure that said Bunny Dead, you know, and uh, which I guess was an inkling. Uh, I'm gonna close with one controversial thing. And that said, I am not convinced Ray Johnson committed suicide, okay? <laughs> and uh, I, I say it's controversial because so many people are, are invested in his suicide. And uh, well, what's you know, your what's your uh, conspiracy? What's your theory about this? Uh, there was an article in the Sag Harbor paper that um, quoted the two girls that heard the splash, 
And I believe they mentioned that they heard a skirmish before the splash. <laughs> so you think he was pushed into the- so I, don't know, I don't know what happened. Skirmish. Oh. You know, but a lot of people have convinced that he committed suicide and I am not convinced. So I don't know, whatever. That's just well, my thing. Let's keep in mind though too, and yes, thank you, John, for sharing all that you shared. Um, you know, we are trying to um, celebrate, but also not celebrate <laughs> Ray's birthday. And I think, you know, I think unfortunately, I guess in my view, so much attention has been cast on the end of Ray's life. Right. And, and I think he was such a vibrant person and so I think that was also some of my impetus that, you know, I think you never know um, all the, com with Ray, you never, no one ever knew anything, everything. And even mm. Bill Wilson, who tried his best to mm -hmm. even read through everyone's correspondence. Um, and here's Bill's beautiful photograph of Ray, mm -hmm. open to many uh, interpretations and readings. And I'm wearing a shirt that Bill gave me that is Zen, 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 Bumping uh, into the corners, many ways to interpret this. Copyright Ray Johnson. Um, but I, I, you know, I think there's there are so many questions. There's so many questions about that, and and even anyone who knew Ray in life, um, I feel like knew different versions of Ray. People are always changing, very much. You know, even now science shows that you know every seven years you're a completely new person. Um, yeah. So, but I I think. Um, Ray put so many questions out and was so elusive, but the, the beautiful part is with all of your interviews, you pin down some things <laughs> that no one, but you also all let Ray be Ray and you were Ray, um, in, in, you were interacting with Ray to also allow Ray to be a version of Ray in, in different ways, which is so great. Can I mention one other thing? Um, sure. I had a, a residency in uh, Venice a couple of years ago, and I got to meet Henry Martin. Yeah. And Henry Martin did the best interview with Ray, hands down, you know. Apologies to these people here who interviewed Ray and everything. But Henry Martin really got him and everything. And, well, and you uh, did such a beautiful interview with Henry Martin that also it, in, um, what is SFAQ? Yeah, yeah, I used to write for the San Francisco Arts Quarterly. It's yeah. online, I believe, yep. the Henry Martin thing. And you should read it because he was a very interesting guy. He's in the hospital now, unfortunately. Um, but um, just a terrific guy who met Bill Wilson when Bill Wilson was teaching up in Maine, I think it was, or wherever he was. And uh, he was, Henry was a student then. And then when he came down to New York, Bill introduced him to Ray and they became, you know, friends and everything. So. And he did that fabulous interview, which stands as the benchmark as far as I'm concerned. Well, and I think um, this interview, which I love how this brings us back and forth between. So I think we'll go to um, Wesleya. <laughs> Wesleya, <laughs> I'm still working on your name next. Um, but I wanna just share, since we're bringing up Henry Martin and yeah, he is not able to join us right now. Um, but I'm going to read a passage that, again, um, I bought the correspondence catalog from BookBeat. That's where I got my copy. Um, and it's the catalog from the Wexner uh, Museum of Art show that was in the 90s. Thank you, Carrie. Excellent. Look, still a copy available there for purchase. Very rare. <laughs> um, but um, and it traveled to the Whitney Museum of Art. Um, but Henry's interview in that is one of the past and um, his Henry's interview reproduced in there, but Henry was gracious enough to also of course, let us um, reproduce his interview in this book, the interviews of Ray Johnson. Um, but Henry asks, I put, I put bookmarks in with all of your interviews. And so now of course I'm looking for Henry's, here it is. Um, but I love this, and it's the title that Henry used for the interview with Ray, his interview with Ray that's in the book. And for anyone who's following along at home, turning page by page, um, Henry's interview begins on page 117. But the part I am hoping to read from is on page 141 to 142. 
And um, this is Ray talking to Henry about some folks um, asking Ray about a statement about art. And um, Ray's saying how the statement that he came up with is, should an eyelash last forever? And I'll just read a portion of, of Ray's response to Henry. Um, I'll probably skip a little bit, but um, so should an eyelash last forever? I do these Korean eyelash collages with these woman shapes that you've seen and that are standing in silhouette for a kind of anatomy study where you look through into the interior of the body. And then I put eyelashes here and eyelashes there, which is sort of like pubic hair. These are works that are very anatomically and sexually referential. So when these people were leaving and like they were so terribly serious, sitting there writing down their notes, asking their questions and they were like writing this book. So as they were leaving, I said, by the way, here's one of these little women that I do. And this woman, Joan Digby just broke up. It hit her in the gut. And she said, because they're eyelashes. You know, I'd just been trying to tell them about Schwitters and Dada and Arp but mainly I was talking about ARP because they had brought up Schwitters and she had a true Dada experience with these eyelashes. So I thought, well, that's my statement. Should an eyelash last forever? The eyelash could be cut in half because these eyelashes are composed of individual hairs, maybe even as many as a hundred of them that somebody in Korea glued down to a strip of adhesive. So the whole thing collectively, so should the whole thing collectively last forever or for one month, or should half of it last for that period of time? Or one eyelash hair, should one eyelash hair last forever? Which then gets down to the point of no eyelash and should nothing last forever? Which is pure Taoism, pure Zen. When you get down to that, which is a point I often get down to in my work, I used to do events called nothings and I'm involved with just absolute space with no art, no eyelashes, no statement, no nothing. And thanks, Carrie, for calling this a nothing and an unbirthday and giving it all of these. I was trying for that pause that, you know, again, sure. I wanted in these interviews to put how much pause there was to try to create the space, but that that wasn't quite possible that, you know, maybe someone will come up with all the pauses to add in. So we have all the space added um, no, properly no. for these interviews. No, it's um, good. But let's. Oh, sorry, Carrie. Yeah, no, I was just going to say that that's a very Ray. I mean, Ray would always kind of say I do nothings and I. I mean, he'd always emphasize he did not op art or he called or pop art. He'd say, I do flop art. So he was, he was he like, would always kind of like, uh, you know, call his, um, his, he tried to erase what, what, he, what he was making or doing a, a lot of times. But then also sometimes there is a correspondence and a reference like yeah. with, um, with Clive Philpot, Ray talks about Buxus which sounds like just making fun and playing with the words of fluxus. But buxus is actually um, the scientific name for a boxwood tree. So like boxwood, the official tree of Ray Johnson. <laughs> well, I, I would like to say this, and I think L, L gets to this in, in his interview too, that Ray is really about connections with people. And that, that's like the key thing there. It's about who he introduces people to in my case, he introduced me to Billy Name, which was like a really important connection because I, I had a little photo gallery and he knew that Billy had just discovered his, uh, his uh, chest that Warhol had, had put away in a warehouse. And it contained all this artwork uh, that he saved for Billy. And he was able to send him his negatives and uh, some artwork. And so we showed we were the f first gallery to show Billy, uh, Billy Name's work. We had him over here maybe two or three times. And he was kind of a, it was a, it was a big moment in my life to, to uh, be with Billy. And Billy had a book, because I had stayed with uh, Jack Smith in New York for, for some time in the, in the 70s. It was a real important thing. And Billy had uh, two copies of, or Warhol had saved two copies of the beautiful book that he put inside uh, Billy's chest, uh, the Warhol chest. And so he had this extra copy, he knew I was looking for it and he just sent it to me out of the blue, which was really a, an amazing kind of thing. And 
there's also a connection with that book with Ray because of Norman, uh, what's his name, Solomon, Solomon, who who worked on the book with with Jack. Hmm. So uh, it was just kind of this funny kind of thing of connections, and everyone had a horrible story about Jack Smith, and I think Ray had one too. You know, he, he used to hit people with frying pans and was a very kind of uh, could be a very violent person sometimes, but. He wasn't well, and Norman Solomon was a photographer too, and they've written about Norman just a bit um, for photographers. But Norman went to Black Mountain College, um, and again, these Ma Black Mountain College community, and I think John, you even talked about community, and here we have this network of people who have met or been put into contact because of Ray, and even years after Ray was intentionally connecting people, um, that we become connected, like as me as a scholar who did not know Ray in my lifetime. Um, I get to meet people and we somehow get to right, discover similarities or interests or commonalities, or we just keep talking right. about Ray. Yeah, these stories are kind of funny. And I think, I think we should make this an annual meeting and <laughs> we talk to other people with other stories. And if I could jump in, Norman Solomon is a very interesting person and uh, a real kind of mystery. I mean, you know, he went to school with Ray they hung around intensely when they got out of Black Mountain and you know were in New York. Uh, Norman moved out to Oakland, uh, married a Japanese woman. Um, <clears throat> he became a male artist, calling himself Mr. Postcards, mm -hmm. and was very active for a while. But when he died, which is about, I don't know, 1998, something like that, everything just disappeared. His wife didn't care about anything. All his photographs of Ray, I mean, he was a major photographer of Ray during that New York period. They're gone. Nobody knows where those photographs are. I, I've heard that you know he went back to New York, but that is a tragedy because they were very important photographs that are missing now. Oh, totally, yeah. And I think um, Maurice Trevoge is still kind, who was, uh, Another person who knew Ray Johnson through the Black Mountain College um, circle and community knew Norman and has some of Norman's photographs. But yeah, trying to find Norman Solomon's photographs is quite a mystery too. But Bill Wilson also very close to, um, to Norman and um, Ray too. So again, kind of this triangle of three people um, that so much um, is known and then so much, is, so much more is not known, but. The person that uh, Solomon and Ray hung out with was Remy Charlotte. Yes. Uh, who was also, there you go. I mean, <laughs> I was, you know, Remy moved out to San Francisco. He had a stroke and I was asked to archive his, his uh, collection. So I really got into that. And uh, that was pretty interesting. That's great to know, John. I didn't know you had a connection to Remy too, but yeah. And yeah. Remy Charlotte is, um, Michael von Yuchterp had done some work, you know, and, and the Ray Johnson estate has too, um, in just putting all sorts of details together. But I learned about it at Bill Wilson's house. But Remy is who Ray, at, at least at one time in Bill Wilson and Michael's uh, research and, and work. But Remy is the first person who Ray um, sends a please send to. So that way that Ray would say, please send this to, let's say for, you know, Ray would say, please send this to John Held to send to Wesleya. Um, mm -hmm. And so just thinking about, you know, how Ray connected people, but um, Re yeah, Remy, a huge person um, that also has not in Black, went to Black Mountain College in Mars Cunningham's um, dance troupe, but yeah, so much more work to be um, looked mm -hmm. into about Remy did children's books, amazing children's books. Well, so the children's first book, the first book he did though was in like 1957 and it was, called The Wonderful World or something like this. What and is was, the world? Yeah. What is the world? It was with Ray Johnson, John Cage, Merce Cunningham, right? Yeah. You know, adding things to the book. So that was amazing. Yeah, Ray does the end papers. And I wish I had a copy. I still don't have a copy of that one. It's but really, um, it's Bill really, Wilson had a copy and it's it's a treasure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, let's let's shift. Um, Richard. Uh, look, we'll go Wesley as just, but let's check in with Richard. Richard, is your audio working, Richard Piper? Can you, can you hear me, Julie? Oh, yes, hello. Okay. Well, I'm on my phone because oh my gosh. I, I guarantee you, 
I, I used this computer last week to teach my Zoom class at Columbia uh -huh. without problems. And, and now suddenly, for some reason, it's not working. But uh, so I'm on my phone. But is that OK for you? Yeah, this looks great. We can hear you good. Uh, can you great. hang in there a little bit on your phone? Yeah, I have it plugged in, so I'm okay. okay. <laughs> awesome. Let's do Wesleyan next, just because I can make a connection, and then we'll yeah. we'll we'll circle back to you. But so glad. Thank you for getting your technological difficulty solved. I so apologize, but I, I guarantee you, I've, I've used this computer for a million zooms, and I have no idea what happened. <laughs> well, um, the ghost of Ray. It, it, yeah, it almost may be a nothing then, right? <laughs> to nothing. That's what it is. All it's right, a fun connection. I was thinking it was so interesting as um, you know, John interviewed Ray after the Barry White performance. And I do think Ray liked to talk to people after he did these performances because it just helped certain things enter maybe an archive record or it might preserve them or you know, just some of these more ephemeral things. That's kind of one thing that I haven't written about with these interviews. But Ray talks about that this performance in your interview. Um, with Ray, and I'll just read just a tiny bit, but then I'd love for you to share how you got to do this interview um, and how you were on the radio show and that it was on the radio. And I have some more <laughs> questions if you want to, but Ray said um, to you, this is 158, if anyone is following along at home. Um, but I think that's the neat part of putting these interviews together. You can be like, oh wait, someone else mentioned Barry White in an ecstasy performance. And then you have two versions of it. Um, but let's see, and here, here, we'll just do this. I've done many lectures and performances using the radio as a prop. John Cage is an old friend of mine, and I've been on what John Cage or Bob Rauschenberg have done with radios. And I've simply taken the idea of using the radio and the chance music snatches and the words that one gets. I've done this in places as far afield as Baltimore, Maryland, and Hamilton, New York. I mentioned my possibly doing floor rolling this evening. In my catalog, Chronology of Correspondence School Meetings, Exhibitions, and Performances, I mentioned the Barry White Ecstasy performance, which happened to be the year that Barry White's Ecstasy was played on the radio, you know, 385 times a day. <laughs> and I had to drive up to Hamilton, New York, because my air flight was canceled, and I was frantically trying to get to a 7 o'clock lecture and had my car radio playing all the way, and all I could get was Barry White's In Ecstasy. So when I got to Hamilton, all I could do was to roll on the floor, sort of in an ecstasy, to loosen myself up a little. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I answered an ad for the college radio station. They were looking for community people who wanted to host radio shows. And I really love to interview people. I love to talk to people. And I did it on and off for about six years. Uh, a lot of weekly live interviews. I, and um, I, I knew Ray not particularly well, but we had many mutual friends. I lived on Long Island. And uh, a lot of my friends were artists and they knew Ray really well. And I was just getting to know him when I asked him if he would do the interview with me. And it was very close to his large retrospective at the Nassau Museum of Art. And I got a postcard from him the day before the interview, which said the part of Ray Johnson will be played by Coco. <laughs> and I had no idea what to expect. I was quite worried. I was very intimidated by him. As years went on and we became actually very good friends, I realized that his first foray into a relationship was usually on the performance level. And as he got to know people, he would open up and become much more Ray the person. And I was very, very lucky to have that relationship with him. And so he arrived, not Coco, and that was a relief. And he started talking almost immediately when he arrived. And of course there were those pauses and I didn't really know what to expect. And my decision was, it's Ray Johnson. I'm just going to let him do what he wants to do. And uh, Julie, I think I might have told you this, but the next day I was called into the program director, the, the uh, station manager's office, who told me that it was the worst 
hour of radio he had ever heard in his life <laughs> and that he really wanted to get rid of me. Unfortunately for him, the entire art section of Newsday was devoted to Ray Johnson's upcoming exhibition. And he had to concede that it was, in his opinion, a coup that yeah. they had had Ray Johnson. <laughs> and uh, so Ray and I just continued. My, my husband was active in the mail art, in the correspondence school. We had very good mutual friends, Carlo Pittori being one of them. Uh, and I, I think that people who actually knew Ray by in person, not by reputation, would all agree that he was an incredibly supportive and caring human being. And that th there was not a single art exhibition by an unknown person in a Long Island library that he did not go to. Oh. There, there was not a single art exhibition uh, with somebody he knew that he did not show up for the opening. There was not, and, and he would often not go in. He didn't go into his own opening. Uh, he stayed outside on the museum grounds tossing around a uh, rubber snake, I think it was. Um, he liked to draw snakes too. He had a, a very, uh, oh, steel trap mind. Just an incredible steel trap mind. I, a tiny detail of your life that you s mentioned in passing would show up in his work. Uh, in our interview, I, I told him that I had something for him from Zart, which was my husband Curtis's mail art name. And he asked me if I'm saying Zart with a port deposit accent. I had told him totally in passing when we were talking about where we were from, that I had recently found out that I wasn't born in Bainbridge, Maryland. I was actually born in Port Deposit, Maryland. I spent zero time there. I was born in a naval hospital and was back in Brooklyn by the time I was two weeks old. But he remembered that and it became part of his shtick with me to mention Port Deposit, which is of course this fabulous name and on the Susquehanna River. Um, we spent a lot of time together as years went on. I actually, I have a wonderful photograph, which is, I have a Xerox of a photograph of Ray and I in my house on Long Island. Ooh, those glasses, both of you. <laughs> yes, he made me wear them. <laughs> I, I can tell you. He actually told me that I had to put them on. Uh, and, you know, I have lots of personal stories about him. He, he encouraged other people to be involved in performance uh, on a regular, totally sporadic basis. Uh, we had a mutual friend, a, a wonderful artist named Crystal Starr, who had a piece rejected from a juried art show. And he suggested to her that he go to the show wearing the piece with a label that said rejected. And she did. <laughs> he was there as well to support her. But but that kind of thing enlivened our, our lives tremendously. Um, I was very, very excited one day because he called and said he wanted to do my portrait. And I was completely thrilled and had absolutely no idea that by portrait, he meant my index finger, which <laughs> he did portraits of index fingers on a proscenium stage. <laughs> and um, actually this picture may have been taken uh, right around that time. He, uh, his ability to connect things, people, incidents, times, dates, uh, it must have driven him crazy <laughs> sometimes, I think, because th there were times when he would just be flooded with these ideas and and he would spew them for a while. And then he would kind of stop and take stock of who he was with and what he was doing. And it would just evaporate. But it would, of course, show up in his work.
later on. Uh, I was in his house. Um, he told me at one point that he kept the radio station that I was on on all the time. Uh, the station manager turned out of this radio station was actually a scam artist and he was selling these spots that that people were on and I didn't know that so I got into a lot of trouble over the years ignoring him <laughs> and what he would do in retaliation was just bump me from my spot and say well you have to book four weeks in advance so then I would book like eight ten weeks in advance and he would complain that I had too much music. I knew a lot of musicians. I am a musician. And uh, that people got very confused when people played music for too long on talk radio, that they didn't know what they were listening to. And, um, and Ray used to talk about these shows, not just mine, but all of these other odd people, a couple of psychiatrists who were always selling their services and... Uh, and other other people who were in business. Uh, and he loved hearing all of this random talk because he made connections to it and about it. And, you know, he's one of the people that we miss. We miss spending time with him. We miss the many little teeny events that, that he would go to that were done in his honor, you know, pie, pie meetings of the pie club, meeting of the so-and-so fan club. He, he would create so many of these little random, lovely things. And people who knew Ray would get to know each other. And he really loved that. So, well and I think your interview um, gives us some insight into like just you were on the ground and you know uh, and even just what you shared here um, in this space uh, but you know raised connection to the Long Island community and so um, and just involvement and you know that's kind of um, I guess I, I think of Ray's life as like born in Detroit so the Detroit chapter there's um, the Black Mountain College chapter, there's the New York chapter, and then there's the Long Island chapter. Um, but, you know, just kind of how he interacts with everyone there in a community or in community minded ways. Um, mm -hmm. Or, too, and I think there's something very ephemeral, which I think Carrie didn't Ray call you, but, you know, just thinking like, what is Ray listening to as he's working? And, you know, what Ray would call people too on the phone. Um, and that's one part of, Ray's, I guess, work or existence or being or just being a person that I think Bill Wilson was always kind of like, but there's this too, you know, and so just thinking of what we know about Ray and what we don't know. So I think that Ray, Ray used to call and he wanted me to give him names of other artists that I knew so he could call them. And he would always do these prank calls with me quite a bit. And they would go they would be one way calls. Like I wouldn't have a chance to even talk. He would just say, uh, Nico's yeah, dead. Nico was dead, click, uh, on the day she died. Cause he knew I liked <clears throat> the Velvet Underground and Nico. Or he would say, look on page uh, 425 in the Warhol Diaries, click. And that just had come out. And so, you know, it mentions Ray once. <laughs> he had this <laughs> sort of index for the Warhol Diaries. So he would do these constant, and then he would call my friends and he would like do pranks on, on the, this similar thing, uh, which they didn't kind of get, you know. I mean, it, it, either you got it or you didn't get it, you know. And it was, it was very playful uh, doing that. And I think, I just remember too that I, I did correspond with him in the 70s. He sent me one of these uh, because I was a little bit involved in mail art for you know doing zines around 74, 75, and I would send out zines to people. And he sent me a, a bicycle seat and it said, add to this and send to so-and-so. And I never did. 
<laughs> I just did, I just saw, oh, gee, I got a Ray Johnson. I'll just keep it, you know. It was kind of like, I don't even know what I did with it, but I just never sent it on. So I, I have one, too, that I was supposed to send on. It was a white pump, a woman's white, uh, low-heeled pump that had a tag on it that said uh, collage by Joseph Cornell. <laughs> I was supposed to send it to Katie Seiden, an, a, a local artist who had the same sounding name as, as me, but we spelled it differently and I couldn't. Yeah, it I was just one couldn't. of his connections that, you know, he wanted you co to connect to somebody else. And that was kind of the whole idea of it, which, uh, is, this makes this thing kind of interesting for me because it's like a lot well, of we were, we were often very good about adding to and sending on. Yeah. We, we mostly <laughs> did what we were asked to do. Every once in a while, though, I mean, the collage by Joseph Cornell, I just couldn't part with. <laughs> um, what, yeah, I think, Wesley, you've given us so many interesting things to think about just now, like anyone who's read or can now reread the interview with thinking of these things. I just wanted to point one out um, that is one reason to, I love your interview, and I think um, what I, I like, and, you know, we kind of said this, but I just want to say it directly in this space, is you played along with Ray on this. Oh, yeah. You know? which is so great and contrasting it with the other uh, interview that Ray did with um, Shirley Sandberg on That's Interesting. Shirley is just not kind of getting it and Ray knows it, you know, and it's just a very different tone. So um, thank you for playing along. <laughs> well, I, I think one of the reasons that we actually became friends as time went on was that he knew that I knew pretty much when to play along and when to call him on it and, you know, and just say, Ray, what's going on? Uh, and there were times, you know, there, there was a long, sad conversation. I think when his mother was ill and every once in a while there, there would just be most of the time it was just playing along, but there were, there were times when it was, although I have to say he did pull a wonderful trick on me. The night of his opening, Carla Pittori and a friend of Carla Pittori's were coming out from Manhattan and they were going to have dinner at our house before we all went over to the opening. And they were very, very late and there was no time to have dinner. So we just packed them in the car and went over to the, the opening, which was about a mile from the house. And when we got home, people started showing up because Ray had told them that... <laughs> <laughs> he was going to be there after the opening. And I, th I think about 50 people showed up. <laughs> it, was, it was my, I call it my best surprise party ever. We had <laughs> <laughs> people just kept showing up until all hours of the night. <laughs> so that, that um, was my favorite. So I guess one thing I wanted to say um, that, again, that I think is just so interesting, and it's just this little kind of footnote that comes through of Ray re, uh, sharing things in the interview that you did with him. Um, and again, it's kind of, you know, what the reader makes of all of these pieces and how the reader puts it together. Um, but this is on page 162 for anyone following along at home. Um, uh, but Ray is talking, and again, I think this there's there's definitely these interviews talk about the idea of the Quaker meeting for meeting, you know, which is interesting because you know you're not really supposed to speak till you're moved, um, and there's supposed to be <laughs> silence. And if we think about Quaker meetings, um, but Ray is talking about um, meetings, and so I'll just read a, a short passage for this, just so people get a flavor too of of what Ray's response is. So I think um, to um, You've asked him a question that leads him to talk at length. So, um, but a meeting with a capital M is an artwork and I have created the meeting or I've created a meeting form for my correspondence school beginning on April 1st, 1968 at Rutherford Place, the Society of Friends Meeting House, which is a historic Quaker structure on um, Stuyvesant. sorry, I still don't have park, someone, New York. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I knew I was like, I don't have it right. 
um, which has a wonderful statue, which I haven't seen in many years. But Peter, can you say the last name one more time, John? Stein. Thank you. I think by Gertrude Vanderbilt, very interesting. Um, Whitney Museum connections there. That's my side. And I think his left leg is a peg leg, a wooden peg leg. And then he, I think he stands on one crutch. It's a rather interesting sculpture, a park sculpture. Um, in Tompkins, Tompkins Square Park in the East Village, which is an interesting, is an interesting park sculpture of a man whose name is Samuel S. Cox. Have you seen it? Unless, um, Wesleya, do I have it right now? Okay. Um, what? Yes, I have. I have and I never paid very much attention to it. Ray continues. The inscription reads that he is the letterman's friend. It is something to do with the post office. He's standing there with his finger raised into the air. The statue gets lots of pigeon droppings on it. The last time I saw it was also completely blasted with graffiti from the East Village Avenue B and C community, which I think is regretful. Want to talk about graffiti? And Ray <laughs>, laughs. And you do have great conversation about graffiti, and you know, but I, you know, I think the thing it's like as someone who is encountered Ray through bits and pieces and scattered in news, like this is a page from the North Carolina Museum of Art Catalog, and it's a page from Ray's book about death. But here is that statue of Samuel S. Cox, too. <laughs> and then here is the pigeon droppings. And this was drawn by Carl Worsom. Um, and, uh, you know, when I talked to Carl uh, years ago, um, and here's Bill Wilson's daughter, um, Ara, so the bad Ara. Um, but, you know, too, uh, Carl said that like Ray was really adamant that he get these pigeon droppings just right, you know? And, <laughs> but again, like, you know, this is kind of me as the researcher, the person who encounters all this more through the archive and through all the work that, you know, you preserved intentionally or not intentionally. Um, but it's fun to, you know, play along and piece these things together. Um, and, you know, just how they're so much more complicated and interconnected and layered, um, I think too. I also went, when I went to New York, I totally tried to go find this sculpture and I found it, you know, and so, you know, Ray kind of also leads you to places that, you know, personally I wouldn't have sought out otherwise, but um, there's lots, but here's, here we're having a lovely Ray and birthday meeting. So we are continuing the meeting form. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> I, I think he would have loved the idea that life was a scavenger hunt and that he sent people off to find stuff. It's one of the things he did, and that he was always finding stuff. One of the things that he did was, um, you know, the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory, one of the genetic research facilities, was not far from Locust Valley. And he tried to get in contact with the woman who had just won a, a, one of the big science prizes. I don't remember which one it was. Um, for splicing genes, and I think he sent her a, a drawing of some uh, dancing blue jeans, and the, the response apparently was not really favorable. He couldn't actually make her understand what he was doing, but it, it was actually wonderful. It was, it was not only funny, but it was, it was also as Ray so often did it was just like the world was out there to be explored and then you let people know what was out there so they could go explore it as well wonderful well and just let's do one more note from yours and then we'll switch over to you um piper um i love this part at the end of your interview um uh, Wesleya, and I'm just curious, and if you don't remember, I understand this is years ago, but, um, you know, you say to Ray, this is your minute. So it's the last minute of the interview. And we put in parentheses, um, or I have in the, you know, there's no talking, there's the sound of some paper movie, maybe writing. And Ray says, that's interesting. <laughs> that's what's the name of the show. Right. But, and then Wesleya, you say, yes. That's interesting. Will, will you read us that line? Will you just say that line for us here? Yes, that's interesting. 
And then there's some more we, you know, I translated it as sound of writing. Um, but Ray says, how much time do we have left? And you say about 10 seconds. And then he actually gives this, uh, you know, kind of official credit. I, Ray Johnson, grant permission to broadcast or review for a later broadcast my participation as a guest lecturer on That's Interesting on February 15th. And he like, he <laughs> says it really fast too. Um, and so I just, but I love that it's like thinking of the radio of medium and what can you do and how do you create mm -hmm. space or how do you do something that maybe registers a slight sound, but also over radio static? Would you hear it? Would you not? But I don't know, do you remember any part about how the interview ended and, and that little bit? I, I know I was relieved <laughs> that I had gotten through it and that he didn't hate me. Uh, and, um, but yes, I, I remember there was, there was a great deal of silence in that interview. And I, I, I took it as a flattering moment that he mentioned the name of the show, that it was intentional. And uh, I just remember feeling like this is okay. Well, and I think it's it's just also like, great, here, here's this response. And it's just it, it kind of wonderful. And what did you say the radio uh, manager said? Like the- Worst hour of radio he ever heard in his life. Yeah. So excellent. Thank you for making the worst hour of radio um, awesome in the world of Ray Johnson. I'm very proud to have done that. <laughs> I'm sure I actually did some really bad ones, but that one was a treasure. Thank you so much. And wonderful. Yeah, I've emailed with you. And so it's wonderful to meet you and, and talk to you in person by voice. Oh, yeah. So thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, it's, it's Piper. Brilliant. Your interview was in 1980 and it was by telephone and recorded with audio, like a mic tap, I believe is the note. So yeah, I can carry, if I can go back 10 years earlier, I can carry forward this theme of chance meetings and, 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 uh, and chance introductions. I was, it was 1969 or 1970. I was a junior at Cornell University getting a degree in geochemistry, geological chemistry, but I essentially had a minor in art history. I just took, virtually every art history course I could take. And for one of those courses, I read this article by Rosalind Carter um, about, uh, do I have the name right? Rosalind? No, um, Ro Rosalind, Rosalind uh, Constable. And Constable. also just on the note, she also did not forward some please send to's to people of what Ray sent things to her. So her archives <laughs> yes. um, for that anyway. article are at the Menil in Houston. Anyway, I read the article and it described work by Ray Johnson. I said, that's it. That's what I'm looking for. That's that's art as I know it. It's not. I'm not. I'm not out to create a painting. I'm out to send something uh, quixotic, enigmatic, and unusual to other people to get them to think. And so I started to send. You know, I'm a young man. All right. I started to send things to Ray Johnson at a, at a, an address that I that I came up with for him. And one day I was in the mail room where I lived. And I saw that there was a uh, that there was an envelope that hadn't been claimed or stuck into anyone's box, and it, the return address it had drawings all over it, and the return address was Ray Johnson, but it was addressed to a gentleman named Alan Lindenfeld. I didn't know who Alan Lindenfeld was. You know, when he didn't live there, and and so I take I took it and opened it up, and in fact, it was a thank you for something that I had sent him, a response for something I'd sent him. I continued to send him things and didn't get any responses. And that summer, when I went to uh, when I went to Europe, I was staying in Marseille, and I would each day I'd buy myself a, a cheap baguette, and and the half of the baguette would remain uneaten. And at the end of my stay in Marseille, I looked at the baguettes and I said, "Boy!" And I carved a French bread penis and scrotum and plugged them together with with. Uh, with toothpicks and I intended to carry it with me although I knew I did carry it with me to the train station I realized that this was ridiculous and I happened to find a box and I said I'll send it to Ray Johnson he'll appreciate this and so I, I sent it to I, I went to the neighboring wrapped it in newspaper closed up the box and sent it and went to a neighboring post office and sent it to Ray Johnson and I didn't hear anything back but the following year 
in a very chance meeting, a completely chance meeting at the School of Architecture, where I also had a course, I met a man named Alan Lindenfeld. And I said, Alan Lindenfeld, I said, do you know Ray Johnson? And he said, yes, how do you know Ray Johnson? And I told him the story and he took me over to his apartment and we looked through missives and drawings that Ray had sent to him, one of which was a thank you note for the French bread penis. And, and, the, and, I, uh, and Alan and I actually got to know each other. It turns out that he also worked, I work in architecture in New York City. He, he also works in architecture in New York City. I did send him your invitation, but apparently he didn't choose not to, he chose not to join. Um, but his, but Ray's, uh, Ray's spirit, was what carried me through my and my understanding of art. And for the next 10 years, I did various conceptual pieces that were um, that were very much in tune with things that Ray might have done. They were they weren't performance pieces, they were conceptual pieces and sometimes conceptual constructs, but mostly they were male pieces. They were they were conceptual pieces that were promulgated through the male. And uh, I was living with another artist uh, in Lower Manhattan. And when one day in 1979, uh, one, of, one of her friends came over and happened to say that she was visiting from, from Colorado. She happened to say, well, we're doing, an, uh, we're doing an exhibit of mail art. I said, well, really? I said, well, I've done some mail art. I said, but um, I got into it because of Ray Johnson. She said, Ray Johnson? And she said, do you know Ray Johnson? I said, no, I don't know Ray Johnson, but I've communicated with him and I've sent him things. And she said, well, then you should do the interview we need for this catalog for the, for the art show. And I said, wait a minute, you just met me. You want me to do an article, a, a, an interview with Ray Johnson for the catalog? She said, yeah, it's the, it's the perfect connection, the perfect non-connection connection. So she set it up and luckily I, I knew enough about his work because I had followed it that I could ask relevant questions. And I also had some questions like the spelling of the New York Correspondence School and, and the origins of the schmoo and things like that that I wanted answers to that were never covered in any of the articles that I read about him. So I did the interview and it was published in, the, in, in, the, um, in that catalog in 1980. And that, Julie, is the way that I met you. Right. Because you heard that, right? And so there's another chance connection. And anyway. um, I have not been to New York since. And so we have not met for lunch. But that was also like one of the things that we were going to do, which is, again, like so interesting because how would we have ever um, gotten connected without Ray? So, yeah. Anyway, I promise to take you to lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Noted. I'll be, I'll be easier to find this time because you, you, rather than I was the first time, I'm sure that all you had was our Piper who pokes around old buildings. Yes. And wait, with the egg. What's that? Hang yeah. on. Let, yeah, let's read this. So, I mean, luckily we do have the internet and if you are a savvy researcher, but our Piper once spent a year and a half photographing people sucking hard boiled eggs into milk bottles. He currently resides in New York City where he pokes around old buildings. Um, but um, luckily I could find out that you worked in historic preservation um, and uh, thank you for replying. <laughs> um, I think too, that's in Rich, Rich um, Piper, um, in your interview uh, on page 107, um, this is also kind of the crux of, or it felt like Ray, and again, I, it's hard to say whether Ray would have liked or not liked, um, things or or whether Bill Wilson would like or not like things but I guess this gave me just a, a reply that Ray says to you um, on page 107 just about why it could be helpful to pull all these interviews together um, but Ray says that's the whole problem all of the activities of the correspond of correspondence art have only been documented in isolated magazine articles or catalogs or whatever and there is no way of knowing who did what when or said what about what when in contrast to file magazine, I, of necessity, had to publish invisible books and do nothings and, you know, deal in things that don't exist. But that's documented in the Detroit Artist Monthly. 
And then, you know, again, he kind of elaborates and says more things. And you even ask him about, you know, uh, his art and then his correspondence art. And, you know, he elaborates on that more than he has in some other places, but also to, you know, not doing that nod and acknowledgement to John held here, you know, you actually interviewed people. So some of these things are, are, are documented too. Um, but I think it was things like that, that Ray would just drop in these that I always felt he was hoping that people would save this or you know here he knew that you were interviewing him for an exhibition catalog so it would end up in libraries and so there well, was the there's thing, a potential to find the the what he says in these forums and interviews well the only reason that this interview by a 29 year old man was successful was because i did have the right questions to ask but i didn't have to pursue them because ray was so valuable it was as if i was setting him up for a for a, a brief monologue and and it was perfect you know that was the only type of situation where this young 29 year old would be able to do a successful interview totally well and, and right like again and you know that's the thing the interviewer is part of the interview too and influences what the interview is like and and for all three of you who are joining us tonight and everyone in this book um that's thank you for interviewing Ray and I've said this to you before but I think um for people who didn't know him or who are curious about him these just shed new lights and new angles on him um I think this is one part from Richard from Piper from your interview um that gets us back to the Quaker meeting idea um so this is page 111 for anyone following at home um and this is, yeah, so here's exactly what you said, um, Richard. I had hoped to ask you from the beginning, this from the beginning, why the New York Correspond Dance School, so D-A-N-C-E, -E, as opposed to the Correspondent School, D-E-N-C-E. -E. And Ray says, oh yes, there are a lot of playful variations in spelling because in 1965 or so, I began the first meetings of people. For example, you would be invited to a meeting to meet me formally or to meet other people that you perhaps had corresponded with, or for you to meet a Michael Cooper or a Yoko Ono or, or whoever. And then these meetings began to have specific themes. The first one took place in a historic Quaker church on Rutherford Place. It was like a Quaker meeting and it was just a meeting of friends, which was a pun on a Quaker meetings. I had sort of hoped that people would have religious convulsions and writhe on the floor and do Quaker shaking. I mean, Shaker dancing, which, you know, it's just kind of, I feel like is Ray playing and following what mind things, associations pop up. But so we had subsequent meetings at Finch College where Toby Spieselman rendered foot massage machines. And I would do things like carrying people physically and group encounter type things. The last meeting just a few weeks ago involved my, pe my asking people to crawl through other people's legs across a Canadian painting on the floor and involved audience participation in a very childlike act action. And Piper, you say, so a performance in effect. And Ray says, well, a participation. And, yeah, and I yeah. just love that, that, I mean, that idea of what is, what does Ray do? He does participations um, and you become a participant in engaging in these worlds and Bill Wilson continued that tradition. And um, tonight we're continuing that we're still participating. <laughs> um, and sorry, we can't open it up to everyone tonight. Um, but I think, you know, everyone's sharing more stories, but I, I thank you for just getting Ray to say that or asking the questions that led to those comments. Um, Julie, I was going to yeah. say that maybe we could stick around for another few minutes just in case people had questions and sure. to anybody. And, you know, there's a chat in here and I can kind of watch it. So if anyone okay. does have a question, maybe they can um, set, put it in the chat. And, uh, you know, for anybody on the panel or anybody out there, or if you have something to say, maybe, uh, you know, unmute yourself and say it. <laughs> Well, I, I, for one, would like to know how Julie got interested in Ray. Good. Thank you. Um, thanks for asking. Um, I saw, so I grew up in Michigan, and I think um, <clears throat> I took art from third through eighth grade private lessons and then advanced placement art in um, high school. And John Olson from Wolf Eyes, the band was actually one of the student teachers. And so I kind of somehow crossed paths with Michigan's underground uh, scene a bit, even as a high schooler. 
Um, but I think, you know, I was into Andy Warhol and the Velvet Underground and REM and just anything that was not my small town in Michigan. Um, but I think Ray, basically too, like the way I got to Ray, um, but was of course the documentary, um, How to Draw a Bunny. Um, I saw this and that's where I first heard of Ray Johnson. And I, then he just fascinated me. I invited the, the filmmaker to come here because he, he learned about Ray from the bookstore. I had, when Ray died, I had a, a little, uh, you know, obituary in this bookstore and he read it and he became obsessed with Ray after he re read the, and before that he only bought like uh, Marcel Duchamp books he collected, Walter did. And so he, he, uh, he asked me about Ray and I gave him names of people I knew who, who he could talk to. And that kind of put him off on this, you know, uh, journey to, to work on that film. Yeah, so look at this full circle back to Carrie Lauren. Carrie Lauren <laughs> helped John Walter discover Ray Johnson, um, you know, which has led to this film that leads to me discovering Ray Johnson. And I think he used some of my music in the soundtrack somewhere. I think when, awesome. when, when he finds, when he goes back in the film and he finds Ray's, uh, he goes into Ray's house and he has set up all these little, uh, you know, puzzles in his house. And this is why I think Ray kind of really did construct his own demise because there were so many little clues about, you know, the number 13 and how he set up the, his pictures against the wall and, and some forward. And, you know, he sent out emails to, or not emails, but mailings to people before and calls and things. And a lot of his friends got these um, messages, you know, before the death. So I I think it was a very performative kind of death. And Bill Wilson even talks about it being like a backstroke, you know, like a like he's mailing himself, you know, into the into the beyond. Carrie, you you have may I add something, Julie? Oh, of course. Um, you know, I when I interviewed Ray by phone. That was the only time that I had ever spoken to him. We had been, uh, I had been periodically sending him things for nearly 10 years, um, but I never had the opportunity to meet him. And uh, when I learned of his death, I was very, very sad um, and reset, regretted that I had just, that we had never been able to meet. The other thing that I would have told him was that his work, um, led me to an appreciation of chance that led me to other artists as well. So there's an artist, I think he's Swiss, named Daniel Speary, who did a publication uh, who, who would assemble chance collections of objects that, that, were, that basically were, had anecdotes around them. And I thought of that as being a very Ray Johnson thing. And, uh, Sperry wrote a book called An Anecdoted Topography of Chance. And I was in, I was about to go to a round the world trip in Asia with a backpack. And I went into Shakespeare's books in Berkeley and I was looking for information about travel books about Asia. And I pulled this one off because, and it said an anecdoted topography. So someone had put it into the travel section, but it was a book about art. And it was such a wonderful chance discovery that I sent a copy to Ray. Beautiful. Well, and I think that's published by, I could be wrong, but is that Dick Higgins as something else press? Yeah. I, think, yeah. I mean, Ray was kind of a Fluxus artist in a way. He's even before, before Fluxus, he was proto Fluxus. And so a lot of people that collected, I know that, um, Gilbert Silverman. The Silvermans from Detroit were big, have, you know, the largest Fluxus collection that they gave away to, to MoMA, the museum, uh, that they did have some Ray Johnson in, in their collection. I knew that. And I was just at their uh, collection recently. They're, they're kind of um, taking the Detroit st collection. And I think that's all going to the Detroit Institute of Art. Wonderful. Well, and I think, so 
there's many, there's probably a long story that I haven't even gotten to the bottom of myself, but um, I think, yes, um, I, I'm from Michigan. So I think my interest in, I, I ended up becoming an art historian and studying, getting a master's in art history, but it was, I spent most weekends during the day at the Detroit Institute of Art. So having the Silverman collection there and just being introduced to Fluxus and then a lot of the musicians that I was friends with, um, you know, kind of knowing about Fluxus um, and being interested in it too. Um, and then Ray led me to Black Mountain College. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm, I'm just exploring, you know, all sorts of questions still circling around Ray, um, but many black, many more Black Mountain College artists, so. Did, did you say that, that John Olson was your teacher? He was our student teacher in high school. I just interviewed him like two weeks ago or a week ago for for an article. It's very funny. Well, and the music and art scene is is rather interconnected in Michigan in a way that it is it's kind of too. I think the artists, the musicians are out and about where some of the artists stay home. And so then the musician art overlap just helps you meet more people. So but when I when Ray was here in the store, he knew I, I was also doing a, a a project called Night Crawlers, which was a male art thing and a noise project. And he recorded some happenings here that that made their way into our music. So that's another kind of noise connection. I don't know if he expected that to happen, but he sent me, he, he's in one of the Nightcrawler's issues where he sent me one of his uh, condoms where he would write, you know, Picasso condom and cut out names, you know, it was a long thing, so I just printed his whole letter, and it's so you could read the whole process inside the zine that we. So cool. <laughs> um, and Carrie, that maybe this touches on that. My friend Amy um, has has asked us a question in the chat, but she said, um, "If you know, because you were in Destroy All Monsters with Mike Kelly and Niagara and Jim Shaw." Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, did, I did give him um, Mike Kelly and Jim Shaw's address. I know he, he called Mike and Mike was very upset about it because, you know, he thought he was a lunatic, basically. And um, <clears throat> which is a, OK. I mean, I don't know. You know, you, I guess it was kind of a risk, you know, that I took. But um, so didn't go anywhere. <laughs> but I think he's in the, I think he, I gave him, uh, is he in the film, the bunny film? Because I, I think I may have given uh, Walter his, his uh, phone. He may be in there. And I gave him Billy name too. So I, I think Billy was in there. Billy is in there. And, you know, I think my memory, I haven't, I'm a little, a little away from the Ray Johnson world these days, um, just in my thinking, but um I believe Ray knows Billy through Billy Names haircutting parties. Yes. And then yeah, yeah, um, very early. And then Ray introduces Andy Warhol to Billy Name through one of those parties. Right. right. So, you know, which is is fascinating. Yeah. Um, and Billy Name is a you know the photographer that Carrie's talked about, but is also the one who has the idea to cover Warhol's factory in silver and there's um, a, or painted there's silver. There's a great Billy Name photograph. You've probably seen this, where of Ray Johnson holding up his pants. Uh, well, Ray called it. I'm holding up uh, Andy Warhol's pants, but it's a kind Ooh. of funny. Thinking of this one, Carrie. Yeah, that's it. He goes. Okay. Yeah. This is me, this, yeah. Ray used to say, "Yeah, that's me holding up uh, Andy's pants." <laughs> it was um, and and just um, this is, I think is great. Uh, sorry, here's the dollar sale tag on this. <laughs> Did you get that here? No. I, I don't know. Is this your tag? Is this your sticker? <laughs> no, no. I don't. I don't know. We have. I'm sure we had lots of those here, but totally. No, um, yeah. All right, um, our interviewers, do you have any last comments that you would like to add or say or questions or? Thank you. I, I wanna thank you very much for doing this. Really wonderful. No, thank thank you. you. It's great I meeting all, everyone here too and finally meeting uh, John Held and you know, it's, it's, it's been fun. Um, I don't know. Uh, 
John, I, w I did have a question for you. I know you're you're involved in archiving. Are 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 you working with mail art in some way, or what? What is it? What kind of archival thing? <clears throat> well, I I think I probably have the largest collection of mail art in the United States. Uh, something like 550 banker boxes of mail art. Whoa. You know, and uh, and I've already placed you know catalogs at the Getty and periodicals at MoMA. My own work is in the Smithsonian. I am a librarian, so I mean, this is what right. I do you now. Yeah. And uh, I do it for other people too, like Lon Spiegelman was a big Los Angeles male artist. I was able to get his collection into the Getty after he died. I should mention that- um, So museums are collecting it, this stuff. I mean, this is kind of, kind of new because I think you said before that this stuff was like, museums won't show this stuff. Yeah, well, it's funny because I, I just wrote an article about how male art and fluxes have been right. um, assimilated into uh, co American cultural institutions. Um, and it all starts at the top. It's MoMA who's collecting, it's the Getty who's collecting, it's the Archives of American Art, this, the smart archivist, you know, I mean, but, it hasn't filtered down very much to other museums, but there are some, some places that have good mail art collections like Oberlin College has a very good collection of mail art through donations and, and purchases. You mentioned this. And, um, oh, John, can, doesn't Iowa as well? And, I, Iowa also. Um, and then I just wanted to mention this um, coming up this, I believe November is the opening date, but it keeps shifting, but the Art Institute yeah. of Chicago yeah. has Bill Wilson's archive and collection. Yes. Um, so Ray's dear friend, and this is gonna be an amazing um, exhibition um, curated by Caitlin Haskell and Jordan Carter. I think I'm getting everyone's names right. Um, but, um, you know, that Bill's archive will be there. But yeah, like, I think the Archives of American Art was one of the first institutions to like, you know, Sam Wagstaff's papers and Susie Gablick's <laughs> papers that have some mail art with them. So, but you know more, John. So, but I just wanted to say a few things there. Yeah, um, you know, and you mentioned the Silvermans in connection with Flux's archives and everything. I should mention Jean Brown too who is another big uh, collector of fluxes and a big friend of Machunas and everything. And uh, there's a show, her archive was taken into the Getty in 1985. They haven't done anything with it since then, but they just published a catalog of the collection and um, they're opening up an exhibition, you know, at the Getty now. Uh, it's, you know, fluxes related, not Ray related. Although I think Ray is in there probably. You know, I, I sent Ray to Jean Brown's archive uh, and they visited and she complained that the only thing he wanted to see was his own file. So <laughs> you know, even Ray, you know, leaned into that. So, yeah, um, no, I mean, he had a huge influence on me, uh, you know, meeting him at 26, 27 and, you know, just such an authentic artist an artist artist. I mean, that's all he was. He was just pure, you know, and the fabulous thing about Ray Johnson, he knew how great he was. Nothing got him down. You know, he just forged ahead. He had every bit of confidence in the world that he was a major artist and he was a major artist. And he associated with major artists. So there was never any doubt in his mind about where he stood. And that's what gave him the power to go forth with all that energy and everything. He had just so much confidence in himself, I believe. God bless him. Um, may I share, if anyone else has any last comments or may I share just one passage? Sure. To send us out? Yes. So yeah, Carrie, let's talk about next year. So uh, if anyone <laughs> has more Ray Johnson stories, write to Carrie at BookBeat and we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll let you know about next year. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, but this is uh, uh, this is on page twelve in my interview, and it's a quote with Clive Philpot will be around then. I know. Let's hope. Let's hope Clive will be okay enough to join us. So, but yeah, well, thank you too for recording this for Clive, and I know there's some other folks we're asking if there's a recording. So, I'll put, thank I'll you put so this much. on uh, um, 
we have a YouTube channel somewhere, so I'll put it, I'll put it up. Wonderful. Okay. Great. Send me the link when you have it. Yeah. Um, all right. Ray says in uh, his interview with Shirley Sandberg, um, but he says, I'm very fond of the idea of the message in the bottle and the chance of it being found or never being. I mean, that's pure romance. And this is what I wrote. The message in the bottle is pure romance, putting a message into a sturdy yet fragile container, releasing it into the water to float away with the hope that it might be one day found. These interviews are like the bottles in the water and Johnson's statements are the messages in them, waiting to be discovered. Their meanings waiting to be made or remade by receptive individuals. Thanks, Julie. Thanks y'all. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Take good care. <laughs> we'll see you next Thank year. You. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Rich. So Thanks. good to see your faces. Yours.